Hello and welcome to Noble Mind. Noble Mind is a podcast exploring mindfulness, meditation, and psychology. Hello, I'm Dr. Kate King. And I'm Alex Gökçe. In this episode, we talk to Ed Yates about internal family systems therapy and its connections to Buddhism and shamanic healing. Edward Yates is a psychotherapist with a PhD in clinical psychology. He taught on the faculty of Harvard Medical School at Mass General Hospital and Cambridge Hospital for over 25 years. He's a certified internal family systems therapist and has found many parallels and synergy between IFS and the Tibetan view of the mind. Ed teaches shamanism as co-director of Center of the Circle, an organization dedicated to the practice of shamanism and shamanic healing. You can get this episode's show notes and join our email list at noblemindpodcast.com. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello, Ed. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and your interests in the areas of psychotherapy and spirituality? Okay. Well, Alex, first, I just want to thank you. It's good to be in your company. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some of my experiences and some of my what I've learned over the years. I'm much more interested in spirituality than I am in religion. Somebody recently said to me, religion is for people who are afraid to, that they're going to go to hell, but spirituality is for people who have been there. Uh, <laughs> and I, I really like kind of like that. Um, <laughs> And one of my early shamanic teachers, uh, Michael Harner, used to like to say that religion is spirituality plus politics. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not particularly, and my early religious experiences, which was as a, uh, a Jewish kid growing up in the suburbs of New York, seemed to have absolutely no spirituality involved, at least for me. Hmm. So. I think I first encountered what you might call some kind of spiritual experience, aside from psychedelics, in my early years in college, in particular, Quakerism. I followed my sister into Quakerism, I think in part because she was very involved in anti-war activities and uh, service of draft counseling at that time. So I ended up attending a lot of Quaker meetings and having a lot of experience of silence and spontaneous kinds of moments that were clearly sort of synchronistic. Historically, I would start there, but mm -hmm. in my psychotherapy training, I had a very formal, straight psychotherapy training. I went to an APA-approved clinical psychology training program and at UMass Amherst. I did my, uh, my internship and a postdoc in psychodynamic psychotherapy at, at Mass General Hospital. And I, uh, I was on the faculty and supervised at, uh, at the Cambridge Hospital for, well, a good 25 years, maybe 30 years. So, and, and in that context, spirituality of any kind, meditation included, was, was really regarded as uh, taboo. Mm -hmm. And I remember there were a couple of early groups in, in the Boston area that were study groups around meditation and psychotherapy, mindfulness and psychotherapy. At that time, the very idea of introducing the idea of meditation was regarded as a violation of the frame of the frame of psychodynamic psychotherapy where it was thought of as being the you know the therapist's agenda and something that was going to take away from the um, validity or integrity of dynamic therapy mm -hmm. um, and that would, that was that's got to be what 20 30 years ago i'm thinking Somewhere around 1990. Things have changed a lot in the field over the last couple decades. My, how things have changed. Yeah, mindfulness is all the rage, but actual 
spiritual practice is not necessarily something that happens or is touted as much. The whole sort of Americanized, evidence-based, I was trained in all that. I was trained in all that kind of research. So I understand that and I respect that. But I also think that the scientific model is really quite limited Mm. in terms of what there are a lot of people in the world of science, my own son, who's a physicist included, who <laughs> basically believe something, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, people are finding ways to measure things like the effects of compassion practices and the effects of mindfulness mm-hmm. on people's lives. And that's actually not a bad segue into IFS, actually, because oh, yeah. IFS... Several years ago, I'm going to say something like four or five years ago, was officially recognized as an evidence-based treatment. And this is internal family systems therapy, which some people in our audience will be familiar with and some people may not know a lot about. So maybe Mm. you could give us a quick primer and then then a deep dive. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I have heard uh, Dick Schwartz, who's the founder and a major, the major contributor, along with several other pretty wonderful um, collaborators, and at, at this point, thousands and thousands of collaborators all over the world. But the actual model itself was largely developed by Dick, and I've heard his intro talk enough times to, I think, do my own version of it pretty well. So IFS is internal family systems is based on originally applying some of the central ideas of family systems to what you might call the inner family. The paradigm shift aspect of it would be the fact that we don't have a unitary self, a specific identity, that's me, that we're all multiples, that we're all made up of sub-personalities, yeah, is it fair to say that when somebody says something like, well, part of me thinks this, or I'm kind of of two minds about that, is that experientially something someone could say is connected That's to right. this? That's right. And if you really get into it, those parts are capable of actually speaking for themselves. And they have their own personalities, and they really exist sort of as beings in, in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and from my experience as an IFS therapist, I've I've come to really know this to be true, Mm -hmm. having had actual direct conversations with (laughs) people's parts. Mm -hmm. And you can tell the difference when someone is, as we say at IFS, inside one of their parts. Mm -hmm. It's very different than if they're not. And the not is really important. So when they're inside their part, it means they're sort of completely taken up by it in some way? or Yeah, taken yeah. up, hijacked. <laughs> People will often say, you know, that's something I never would have done, but I just was so, so upset, so mm-hmm. taken over that I, that I had to. Mm-hmm. Um, so does trauma and attachment injuries affect parts in a certain way? Do, do people without yeah. experiences of trauma and attachment injuries already have parts? Yeah, everybody has parts, lots mm-hmm. of parts. And I think in this culture, or really pretty much anywhere at this point in human history, it's unlikely that you would find anybody that doesn't have some kind of trauma history. Mm-hmm. Even though there are probably people who would walk around trying to pretend to themselves that that's not true. Mm -hmm. I remember this from understanding things psychodynamically, that there are aspects of ourselves that for our survival and our uh, functioning need to be suppressed or repressed. If you switch the lens to a lens of parts, then it becomes necessary within ourselves to exile is the word, exile aspects of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And particularly the most vulnerable and the most wounded aspects of ourselves. Because if those parts are the ones that we're blended with, that we become, 
then that's how we're going to act. And that's how we're going to present ourselves to the world. And that's really not practical. <laughs> the most important discovery, I think, besides the multiplicity discovery that Dick made, he was working with bulimic families. And the, the idea was if they could just change the family structure, this was when structural family therapy was in the vogue. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is probably in the 70s. He was doing a study where if you could just change the family structure, mm. I remember seeing some tapes that suggested that that might be possible, then the symptom would go away because the symptom was a response to the context. Mm -hmm. And what Dick found and often says is that the bulimic girls in the study, some of them, or many of them, just didn't get the memo that they were cured even though they succeeded mm -hmm. in, in shifting the family structure around. And as a result, he became curious and he started asking them what was going on inside them. Do you mean that the family dynamic did change, but they remained bulimic? So they, they remained right. having those symptoms? Okay, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. They remained having those symptoms, including cutting and, mm -hmm. and some, pre some pretty extreme things, dangerous things. Mm -hmm. He applied one of the techniques of family therapy, which is that if you find in a family that, that the daughter is having a conversation with the mother, and, but there's an aspect of the mother that the daughter doesn't like and the father also doesn't like, and there's an alliance. If there's another family member that's allied, if you ask them to step back, then what was a very fractious conversation can calm down quite a bit. So he started applying that inside and asking parts to give space to step back. And when that happened, a completely different person showed up mm -hmm. who was compassionate and caring, open and warm and uh, curious. So there might be several parts or, or one loud part maybe and a couple other parts. And if you can... He was sort of asking right. the the louder part to step aside to make room for one one or more of the other parts to yeah, like if he no. was saying well let's let's talk to the one that makes you uh, that makes you binge, and then there would be other parts that wouldn't let that happen and I've had that experience a lot where somebody wants to talk you know work with whatever they were triggered with this week, and then there'll be another part of them that'll say, uh-uh, we can't go there. Hmm. And sometimes if you'll ask that one sincerely, if it would be willing to give some space so that we could get to know the triggered part, then they will. And at that point, if you ask the person, well, what's your feeling towards that triggered part, which you've already identified the place in their body where they feel it in and around their body. Um, they'll say, well, you know, I, I'm curious about it. I, it seems to be suffering. That is what in internal family systems is called the self. I remember Dick saying, so what is that part of you? And the person would say, well, that's, that's not a part. That's yeah. actually me. <laughs> and that's true. That's, that's who actually each of us is. Mm -hmm. If you can kind of pull back the layers of the onion enough, that's the essence of each of us. And that, I think, is profound. And that changes everything to yes. recognize that the essence of each person is wise and compassionate. And that's where there's a great overlap with the Buddhist mm -hmm. idea of Buddha nature, mm -hmm. that we all are essentially pure essence, which is love. and wisdom. And, and it turns out that, that that aspect of us or that essence of us is capable of healing all the parts, which is the sort of fundamental thing that, that IFS has to offer. And we, when people get that, they get very excited and devoted to mm -hmm. IFS as I have, because it becomes clear, plus it actually works. <laughs> as a therapist, I listen in a caring way to people's narratives for 
35 years or so before I encountered IFS. And they would eventually change in a kind of osmotic way. My clients got better, you could say. But now, very often when somebody comes in and says, well, this really upset me this week, and we work with that, they'll come back the next week and say, well, I ran into the same situation. It just wasn't upsetting. I didn't get mad at my son. Hmm. I got mad at my son last week. Wow. So you really see results. So it's, it's a combination of the sort of astonishing beauty uh, and spiritual essence of that, uh, of what we would call the self with a capital S, which is the same, it's the same essence that has been um, sort of discovered by spiritual traditions all over the world. And it turns out there's a way to make that available that's a way simpler than going into a cave and meditating for 20 years. You know, can happen in uh, 15 minutes <laughs> or less. <laughs> I suspect some of our listeners will feel intrigued and validated that yeah. some of their experiences are, are uh, you're describing them. And other people may be skeptical. Yeah. And I was watching a, a Dick Schwartz video where he says, quote, it sounds woo-woo and new agey, but it does work. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I probably on the left wing of in the IFS community when it comes to the, the spiritual aspect of, of IFS, because I, I came at it already as a person who was trained and who had years and years of meditation experience and lots of uh, experiences that might be regarded as woo-woo or new agey and also uh, shamanic training. So maybe this is a good time to, to make that connection between internal family systems and, and Buddhism. I mean, you've already talked a bit about how, yeah. you know, Buddhism has a lot to say about the, the self, so to speak. So yes. <laughs> um, we could go down and yeah. then talk a little bit about that maybe. Yeah. It, it actually depends on what flavor of Buddhism or what, yeah, what, the lineage or tradition of Buddhism mm -hmm. you're talking about. And I've fortunately had exposure to uh, several of them. I started out in the Zen tradition, which is a Mahayana tradition, or relatively similar to the Tibetan tradition, and it's sort of in the in terms of the sutras and the the belief system. And then also had a lot of experience with Vipassana and mindfulness. The conceptual difference would be that in the Mahayana tradition, the attitude is the bodhisattva attitude, which is, may I be enlightened so that all beings can be enlightened, and may I develop over lifetimes so that all beings can be enlightened. And the earlier traditions of Buddhism seem to be more oriented towards, may I be enlightened, Period. <laughs> yeah, period. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess one thought that, that comes to mind for me is that, you know, IFS talks about these different parts, and then there's kind of a, there's a self in there that sort of is more, more fully formed or, or is more like your true self versus these kind of fractured parts, maybe. And sure. uh, you make that connection with the Buddha nature, which I think is helpful, because otherwise I'm sort of wrestling with squaring the two off with each other, because there's a lot of teachings in Buddhism about there not being a self at all. Right. Yeah. Well, if you really look into it deeply, that I think ends up being true. Right. But that not self is the same as the self with a capital S. Ah, got it. <laughs> I've been fortunate to be a part of a, a dialogue or a multilogue among <laughs> Lama Willa Miller, Lama John McCransky, and Dick Schwartz on these topics. And there have been two public events, one last spring, which turned into a video, which is a day-long workshop on where Lama John, who is a, just a brilliant teacher in the Tibetan tradition, he's worked really hard to refine Tibetan practices and make them kind of non-sectarian. So, And Dick uh, 
the two of them seem to agree a lot. And in particular, one of the areas that I think can be problematic in Buddhism is the attitude toward what you might call afflictive emotions Mm -hmm. or kleshas, or they're sometimes called um, obscurations. Mm -hmm. They can be called karmic patterns. There's a lot of different language for it. But the attitude in some Buddhist traditions is that this is what we need to get rid of in order to be enlightened. Mm -hmm. And the attitude in IFS and also in in, uh, some of the Mahayana traditions is that they are not defilements. They are to be welcomed and loved. And when they are welcomed and loved and held in compassion, then they can heal. And that is true in IFS, and it's also true in wisely taught Buddhist traditions. And this has a lot of implication for the meditator, for kind of what do you do if you can't concentrate or if you get thrown out of a, out of a practice or you're trying to do a practice but you're agitated. There are a lot of you know, very practical implications for meditators and also for therapists, in a sense, to be a good therapist, whether you're an IFS therapist or a psychodynamic therapist or whatever kind of therapist you are, your job really is to be as in that big S self as possible. It's very easy as a meditator and as a therapist to inadvertently kind of get behind that let's get Ooh. rid of unpleasant feelings yeah. <laughs> kind of mindset. Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. it can be very subtle. Coming from a, a family therapy and attachment theory perspective, yeah. Dick Schwartz says that he, uh, when working with people with very damaging attachment experiences, even, yeah. he realized that there is some quality here that, and he calls it the eight C's yeah. of self with a big S. Right. Calmness, curiosity, clarity, compassion, confidence, courage, and creativity, which he saw were inherent to human beings, even even with very very damaging attachment experiences. So then that connects with Buddha nature, I suppose. Right. Mm, Yeah, it doesn't matter how how pathological someone might appear. That's in there, in everybody. The pathologicals in air quotes for our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the wonderful things about IFS is it's a, it depathologizes all of the things that our field has gone to great lengths to pathologize and categorize and organize mm-hmm. and, and come up with ways of trying to stamp mm-hmm. out the sort of medical model. Right. In a sense, the idea is to see if you can kill the messenger <laughs> rather, rather than get the message. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I owe that quote to uh, Lissa Rankin, mm-hmm. who's a, a physician who has a great spiritual orientation. Mm-hmm. So those difficult emotions or... Um quote, symptoms uh, would be me- the messengers, and there's something to be found in That's there. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The whole approach of drawing battle lines and right. relating to parts of oneself as enemies to be stamped out or to be silenced itself causes very large difficulties. Yes. It's at, very counterproductive, isn't it? At, yes, at every level of every system. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. includes... Each of us is walking around human beings. It also uh, works in families and in communities and in larger systems like countries. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that points out that, which we haven't made explicit, I don't think yet, about the internal family system being approaching your internal experience as, as a system. So it's sort of a microcosm f- you know, for how you might work with or approach larger systems, as you're saying families, right. communities, and, and onward out. Yeah, and, and one of the key things that comes up is that there end up being polarities between parts within us. This is similar to what, Kate, you were referring to before, mm-hmm. that there'll be one part that wants to eat the cheesecake and another part that 
thinks it's a really bad idea to eat the cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> that can make it really, really difficult. Yeah. Or you might have a part that decides, well, I don't give a shit. I'm going to eat the cheesecake. <laughs> and then afterwards, you're awash in shame from the part mm -hmm. that thought you shouldn't have eaten the cheesecake. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that it has a lot of application to, uh, to addiction in mm -hmm. particular. Mm -hmm. But when you can get those polarities to, uh, and you can listen to each side of the polarity from biggest self, and then sometimes even get those parts to listen to each other, things get more harmonized. There's more peace in the system, and it's a lot easier to make decisions. Feels like a very timely connection to things going on in the world as we're recording this, too. There's a major polarities being played out, you know, in our nation right now. So right. this is a useful perspective to think about having those polarities inside of ourselves as well. That's true. Yeah. Everybody, everybody's got their version of both sides of the polarity that's mm -hmm. getting played out out there, I think. This is, is a slight non sequitur kind of segue, but I'm noticing the time and I want to make sure we can cover a little bit on shamanism since you've mentioned that a few times. Yeah. Well, at one point, around the same time as I was really developing my Zen practice, I became very curious about shamanism through a book that somehow ended up in my car. I don't, don't know exactly how it got there. <laughs> um, it's called Soul Retrieval. It was written by a woman named Sandra Ingerman. It actually was about parts. It was my hmm. first introduction to parts. Hmm. It was about how shamans in all cultures, in all indigenous cultures, have a way of going into the spirit world and retrieving lost soul parts of people hmm. and bringing them back to heal, it's really to heal dissociative trauma. And there's a whole description of what soul loss is. The treatment for soul loss and from a shamanic perspective is soul retrieval. And uh, as a therapist, I was really fascinated by that mm -hmm. idea. And as that happened, there were some, some of my clients started having spontaneous soul return experiences that seemed to be very illuminated where things shifted in a deep way and parts of them along with the story kind of returned along with the story and the feeling and they felt more whole and integrated afterwards so i got really curious about that i arranged to have my own soul retrieval which was very very kind of pivotal moment in my life and uh after that, I just couldn't help getting some shamanic training in order to be able to do that sort of thing myself. <laughs> to the extent <laughs> you're able to, I, I don't know what's sort of private or not shared publicly or what, um, what, what does a soul retrieval ceremony include or look like? Or, or what, when you say I had my soul retrieved, what, what, is, what can give us a sense of and I, I realize there's this is done in different ways in different traditions, shamanic traditions are all over the world. But yeah, maybe a yeah, nugget I mean, about what you went, what you experienced, if you're willing. Yeah, I plan to teach on this. Actually, a friend of mine named Derek Scott, who's in Canada, is doing master classes for IFS therapists, and I'm signed up to do IFS and shamanism, a three-hour class sometime in the fall. So I'm prepared. I'm prepared for that question. In some indigenous cultures, there might be somebody who had an experience after which they just were never the same. And the whole village would participate in a ceremony where of trying to call back the soul part, the soul mm -hmm. of that person mm -hmm. uh, with drumming and dancing. And, but the, the sort of shamanic technology, you could say, that the specific method that I was taught and that's commonly understood to be not something that people thought up as a, like, this would be a good idea, <laughs> but more that there are compassionate spirits 
who are accessible to us if we can tune into that station on the radio. <laughs> Uh, if we learn the certain methods of contacting them, particularly the shamanic journey. And that's where these healing methods come from, is that they're taught to us by the spirits themselves. And the method itself, when it comes to soul retrieval, is that a shamanic practitioner will journey into the spirit world with the intention I want to find any lost soul parts of Kate or mm -hmm. this person that are willing to come back to help at this time. Mm -hmm. And then the shaman will go on a, a kind of a, a search, a hunt, and will often encounter a, a part of the person that is stuck in a scene in the past mm -hmm. uh, and will witness that and do a healing with that part and then bring it back and blow it literally blow the part you often the, the part the soul part is held in what's called a soul catcher which is often a, a crystal and that'll be placed on the person's heart chakra and then the shaman shamanic practitioner will blow through the crystal and that part will be returned and then they'll tell a healing story to the person about what happened hmm. and uh they'll also get in the process uh what qualities are being brought back for the that were lost at the time and they're you know part of the ceremony is rattling using a rattle to rattle around the the individual's energy field so that that sort of seals up the energy field so the change will hold yeah, so that's one way of describing how that ceremony is done. Mm -hmm. and I think you've described it as a turning point for you when you went yeah. through it. Yeah, and there were three, uh, three parts of me that got retrieved by uh, Sandy Ingerman. And she also brought back several power animals for me to get to know. And that stuff's relevant, too, to the present. To talk a little about when I mentioned that there are compassionate spirits, compassionate spirits include many, many different kinds of spirits. There are spirits of plants in indigenous cultures. There are certain healers who get to know the plants and find out what the plants can do to help heal. And that's where a lot of botany and uh, herbalism comes from, mm -hmm. actually. It's from people who know how to listen to plants. And then there are animals, animal spirits, which are different from the actual wild animals, but compassionate spirits in the form of animals, which can be all the different kinds of animals. Each animal has its own power and its own capacities. And it's said that to survive childhood, you have to have power animals because they are the guardians of your life and your immune system. And that's very relevant now. A lot of times I'll get the question, how, how do you know if you have power animals? And I'll always say, well, of course you certainly do. You just don't actually know because you haven't tuned into that station on the radio, but you can, <laughs> Every, everybody pretty much can if they mm. practice all these things require a certain amount of practice and mm -hmm. you know everybody's path is different people have usually quite a few power animals if you look at a totem pole that's a good rendition of somebody's power animals that are lined up with their energy centers but for us one way to tell what one of your power animals is if you look around your house or you think about when people give you gifts, if you're constantly getting gifts of giraffes or frogs or, or you know, you have sort of a favorite animal, and it might not even be an animal that you identify with. It might be a chicken or <laughs> a snake or whatever. There's a good chance that that is an animal that's been looking after you. And the whole idea that there are, to me, is very touching and still is that 
that there are spirits out there that are pure, compassionate presences that are looking after me. I have parts that at points in my life felt like there was nobody looking after me. Mm, so so it's very, very touching to me. I know that now is true. And that there are shamanic practitioners who are actually willing to go into the spirit world to be intermediaries between those spirits and us is also a very touching. The devotion and dedication that's involved in that is quite beautiful. Yeah, and I think that people will, you know, people will share share this worldview or not, or or sh- or have yeah. these experiences or beliefs or not. But it does, you know, especially as you were talking about the soul retrieval part. I think it touches on like a real longing a lot of people have to feel whole. Right, that's right. Yeah, and it was wonderful for me to discover IFS internal family systems because. There is a method that is designed for this time and place mm-hmm. where you don't have to have people who are believers in mm-hmm. rattles and drums and <laughs> smudge and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my practice used to be people would come to me for shamanic healings and then I would have my psychotherapy practice and I would not bill insurance for my <laughs> they wouldn't like that probably. For the shamanic yeah. stuff. <laughs> um, sometimes I think I might have done that and put in my note that it was guided imagery. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I try to be really ethical about all that. But then in internal family systems, I discovered that there was kind of a, a meeting ground mm-hmm. between those two aspects of my clinical practice so that just regular ordinary people could have experiences like that of becoming more whole and not suffering as much, I guess Mm -hmm. you could say, an effective way that I think it really does draw on some shamanic, you know, this is sort of basic human psyche stuff. It's stuff that Jung understood, I think. And um, it's not scary. It's actually really very sweet. I like that as a sort of takeaway message that the, you know, that the shamanic healing and the, you know, modern psychotherapy, particularly IFS, maybe are not so different as some people might think. Yes. And the way that IFS is practiced, I think, or at least the way that it's taught by Dick is that you don't introduce the more spiritual aspects of things as a therapist. If they spontaneously arise, you recognize them, just like you welcome whatever spontaneously arises, because there are no enemies inside or out, actually. Mm -hmm. I know I'm very careful not to make it my agenda for people to think like me or Mm -hmm. believe like me or I wouldn't even regard it as belief. Right. It's more of a com- coming out of an experience, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah. yeah. This this stuff just spontaneously shows up. And the, the idea is to just let go and let what what needs to show up, show up, rather than think that you have a model that decides what is supposed to show up. So I'm constantly having to just let go of what idea I have about what's <laughs> going to happen next what's going to happen in a session or Mm -hmm. with a person, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think that modern therapy is right, is rightly criticized, although not, maybe not criticized enough about leaving out the spiritual realm. Right. I think it's a good question to ask when you're doing an intake. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do you have a spiritual practice or is there a spiritual aspect to your life? And a lot of times you'll find out stuff that you would not otherwise guess. Mm -hmm. Um, And it makes that people feel, I think, a lot more comfortable, you know, because often folks have had dead people who've shown up in dreams or Mm -hmm. they've felt the presence of of ancestors and um, wondered. And when people really feel free to speak their truth, they will often report those kinds of experiences yeah. which are pretty ubiquitous among yeah. humans, but are often 
especially in the therapy culture, regarded as problematic because they don't fit the model. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why it's exciting that internal family systems has been accepted as an evidence-based treatment. And there, there are other studies going on right now that are likely to get good statistical results so that there can be multiple studies. The study that this designation was based on was a study of rheumatoid arthritis where uh, people in IFS therapy were invited to see if they could get to know their arthritis and listen to their arthritis. Mm -hmm. And when people listened to their arthritis and sympathized with their arthritis, their arthritis got better. That's great. Uh, And there were Mm -hmm. physical and psychological measures of improvement that were it was published in the Journal of... Rheumatology, maybe? Yeah. 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 Oh, we're going to have to find that article. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. yeah. This stuff is for real. Love it. Well, and this has been really great. Is there uh, any other closing thoughts you want to share? Or Well, just, just to make the point that, um, that Tibetan Buddhism, if you really look at it, has a sort of shamanic base to it. It's sort of just a very, very refined, very thought through, very deeply refined version of of things that show up Mm -hmm. spontaneously all over the world. And that it's important. I think every religious tradition has a shamanic base to it. And Tibetan Buddhism is a religious tradition. Yeah, just just to sort of, I just wanted to kind of underline that point before we stop. That's great, thank you. Um, there's a lot more that could be said about all absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Are there ways you would like our listeners to be in touch with you or anything you would like to invite them to? Well, if people are into IFS, I would really encourage them to have a look at this. It's a look because these are video recordings. There's a podcast called The One Inside that is popular in the internal family systems community. And I recently did a podcast with Tammy Sollenberger. That Mm -hmm. would be one way to get a little bit more of me, but she also has interviewed Dick Schwartz and Mm -hmm. a whole series of internal family systems luminaries. And then this masterclass that I'm going to do sometime in the fall would be another opportunity. And there it would be uh, looking into DerekScott.co. C-O. So those would be two things I would invite Great. people to explore further. Oh, and there's one other thing that I would just want to add, which is that if you go to the IFS uh, website, Internal Family Systems, it's now called the IFS Institute. In their store, you can find, I think for 40 bucks, this full day workshop with Lama John McCransky, who's just brilliant, and Richard Schwartz, who's also brilliant, and me and Lama Willa Miller as discussants. And you can actually experience the full day workshop where that includes a demo, a demonstration session by Dick Schwartz of someone who had a spiritual bypass thing going on, which is very powerful and very Mm -hmm. moving. That's in the afternoon session. And in the morning session, Dick does a great intro to IFS and he does some guided meditation experiential stuff. And then, and then Lama John, has this extremely carefully developed set of compassion practices that he begins the introduction of in the morning and continues in the afternoon. Mm. And that that is available. Eventually, their second public, public conversation will be available. And I'm proud to have been sort of assigned the task of, of helping that whole discussion and conversation happen. And, and also now there is this document of it that's available to everybody. 
That uh, sounds great. And like, it would be really up the alley of our listeners, you know, since it's building yeah. those bridges really between IFS and Buddhism. And it's yes, great. It, yeah. it was actually sponsored by uh, the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Among other or organizations. <laughs> so. Well, thanks. Yeah, we'll we'll look those up and put those links on our episode page so that Fantastic. people can access them all in one place. So thanks Thank again you. for your time, Ed. This was a really wonderful conversation. Thank you. It was really fun for me. Thank you so much for sharing of yourself so deeply. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll hit subscribe, leave us a great rating or review, and spread the word. You can also go to noblemindpodcast.com to join our email list. You'll get a weekly behind-the-scenes message, news, announcements, and other special goodies we come up with just for you. Thanks for listening, and bye for now.